One of the biggest archaeological discoveries of recent times is being celebrated by a team at the University of Leicester. A skeleton found under a car park in the city centre has now been confirmed as that of King Richard III, who died at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. For centuries, we believed the Plantagenet line was the divine ruler of England, unbroken and pure. That belief ended the moment scientists extracted genetic material from a tooth found in a shallow grave in Leicester. What started as a triumph for archaeology has mutated into a nightmare for traditional history. New forensic data reveals a non-paternity event that shatters the legitimacy of the entire Yorkist dynasty. Basically, the DNA suggests that the man we call King was actually the son of a nobody and the implications are absolutely massive. Unearthing the Last Plantagenet the story of the king in the car park sounds like the setup for a bad joke, but it is actually one of the most significant archaeological victories of the modern age. For 527 years, that is where the story of King Richard III ended. He was the last English king to perish on the battlefield, struck down at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. He was the final king of the Plantagenet dynasty, and his demise marked the end of the brutal, decades-long Wars of the Roses. His victorious enemies, the Tudors, led by the new King Henry VIII, wanted to make a violent example of him. They paraded his unclothed body, slung over a horse through the streets of Leicester. It was the ultimate act of humiliation, a message to all of England that this dynasty was over. After that, he was given a simple burial in a rough grave at a church known as Greyfriars. But here's the catch. History moves on. Just a few decades later, during the Reformation, the church was torn down. Its stones were carted away, its land was sold, paved over, and repurposed. Within a few generations, the exact location of the king's grave was lost. It just vanished. Legends sprang up claiming his bones were dug up by a mob and thrown into the nearby River Soar. He was, for all intents and purposes, completely lost to history, remembered mostly as the monstrous, deformed villain in Shakespeare's famous play. That is, until a screenwriter named Philippa Langley had a hunch. She became obsessed with Richard, not as the monster, but as the man. She felt the historical accounts were nothing but Tudor propaganda. She spent years poring over ancient, dusty maps, trying to overlay the old city of Leicester with the new modern one. Her research kept pointing to a most undignified spot, a drab asphalt city council parking lot. It sounds crazy, right? Everyone thought it was a fantasy, a total waste of time and money. She was told repeatedly that he was in the river, that the grave was destroyed, that she was chasing a ghost. But she convinced the University of Leicester to take a chance. In August of 2012, they broke ground. They cut a neat trench about six feet wide and 50 feet long right through the asphalt, digging into the hard clay below. The media called it a wild goose chase. But on the very first day of the dig, they found human leg bones. It was a stunning start, but it could have been anyone. This was, after all, an old church graveyard. The team carefully, painstakingly brushed away centuries of dirt, and a story began to emerge from the earth. The skeleton, officially named Skeleton One, was found in a grave that was crudely dug and, get this, too short for the body. This forced the head into an awkward, propped-up position. This was not the burial of a beloved monarch. It was the hasty, disrespectful work of his enemies. The skeleton belonged to a man in his early 30s. Richard was 32 when he met his end. The bones themselves were riddled with injuries, 10 of them in total. Eight were to the skull. This wasn't a random arrow. This suggested a brutal personal attack after his helmet was lost or removed in the chaos of battle. Two of these head wounds were massive, either of which would have been fatal. One was a sharp force trauma to the base of the skull, likely from a sword. Another was a horrifying puncture from a halberd, a long polearm weapon that went straight through the top of his head. This wasn't just a man who perished in battle. This was a king who was surrounded, unhorsed, and finished off in a frenzy. But the real aha moment, the detail that made the archaeologist's hearts pound, was the spine. The skeleton had a severe twisting curve, a condition called adolescent onset scoliosis. For centuries, Richard III had been famously depicted by Tudor propaganda as a poisonous hunchback toad. 
The bones proved this was a vicious exaggeration, but it was rooted in a real medical condition. The curvature was so pronounced it would have made his right shoulder sit noticeably higher than his left. This single anatomical feature matched historical descriptions perfectly. Later analysis of the teeth and bones using a technique called isotope analysis revealed a diet rich in seafood and wine, the kind of expensive food only a high-status individual could afford in the 15th century. Everything was pointing to one unbelievable conclusion. They had found him. Still, this was all just strong circumstantial evidence. To be 100% sure, they needed something more powerful. But the blood held a secret that would ruin everything. The Science of Illegitimacy With the skeleton of a potential king lying in their lab, scientists at the University of Leicester faced a huge challenge. Getting usable DNA from bones that have been in the ground for over 500 years is incredibly difficult. And that's putting it lightly. Ancient DNA degrades over time. It shatters, breaking into tiny, fragmented pieces like a priceless vase dropped on a concrete floor. Even worse, it is easily contaminated by the DNA of everyone who handles it. We are talking a single skin cell, a sneeze, or a stray hair from an archaeologist. The team, led by geneticist Dr. Turi King, had to work in sterile cleanroom conditions. They wore full protective gear, looking more like astronauts than historians. They carefully drilled into the king's tooth and a dense leg bone, the femur. These are the best places to find preserved genetic material locked away from the elements. Their goal was simple, find a living relative and see if the DNA matched. So here's the deal. Most of our DNA, the stuff that decides our eye color and height, gets shuffled with every generation. It is a mix from mom and dad and their moms and dads. It is useless for tracing a specific line over centuries. But there are two exceptions. The first is mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA. What most people don't realize is that mtDNA is passed down only from a mother to all her children. Your father's mtDNA stops with him. This means your mtDNA is identical to your mother's and your mother's is identical to her mother's and so on. It is a perfect family signature passed down the maternal line almost unchanged through thousands of years. Richard III had no surviving children. His only legitimate son, Edward of Middleham, perished young. But Richard had an older sister, Anne of York. Genealogists, led by the historian John Ashdown Hill, worked for years on a staggering feat of historical detective work. They traced Anne of York's female lineage from her to her daughter, to her daughter's daughter, and so on for 17 generations, all the way to the present day. They finally found two living descendants. One was Michael Ibsen, a Canadian-born furniture maker living in London. The other was Wendy Doldig, a distant cousin. They both agreed to give DNA samples, swabbing their cheeks for science. The lab then began the painstaking process of extracting the fragmented mtDNA from the 500-year-old skeleton. They had to piece it together, clean it of contamination, and then compare it to the modern, clean mtDNA from Michael Ibsen. When the results came back, the team had their answer. It was a perfect match. The mitochondrial DNA from Skeleton 1 was identical to Michael Ibsen's. The specific type of mtDNA they shared, known as haplogroup J, is actually quite rare, found in only a tiny fraction of the European population. The odds of this being a coincidence were astronomical. The archaeological evidence, the battle wounds, the scoliosis, and now the genetic proof, it was a slam dunk. In February of 2013, the University of Leicester announced to the world the skeleton in the car park was, beyond any reasonable doubt, King Richard III. The mystery was solved, the world celebrated, but the scientists weren't done. They had another test to run, and this one would blow the whole story wide open. They decided to look at the second type of special DNA, the Y chromosome. This is the piece of DNA passed exclusively from father to son, just as mtDNA is passed from mother to child. It is what makes a male male, and it also acts as a paternal family signature. In theory, Richard III's Y chromosome should match that of other men descended from his male line ancestors. The team tracked down living male line relatives of Henry Somerset, the fifth Duke of Beaufort. 
These men were known, documented descendants of King Edward III, who was Richard's great-great-grandfather. If the Y chromosomes matched, it would be the final glorious piece of the puzzle. The samples were tested, the data was analyzed, and the results were a total, complete, 100% mismatch. They didn't match at all, not even close. The king's paternal DNA line was broken. Somewhere in the 19 generations separating Richard III from his modern-day relatives, someone's father wasn't who the history book said he was. This wasn't just a genetic anomaly. It was the hard scientific proof of a hidden royal scandal. The break wasn't random. It was a targeted betrayal. The Illegitimate Dynasty The Y chromosome results sent a shockwave through the historical community. It wasn't just a mismatch, it was a genetic impossibility. The DNA was telling a story of a false paternity event, which is the polite scientific term for infidelity somewhere in the royal family tree. What many overlooked at the time is that this wasn't just palace gossip from beyond the grave, it had enormous earth-shattering implications. The entire claim of the Plantagenet kings to the throne, the very thing they fought and perished for in the Wars of the Roses, was based on an unbroken line of succession from father to son. This bloodline, they claimed, was ordained by God. This DNA proved that the bloodline, the very foundation of their power, was not pure. The most shocking fact is that this discovery meant that at some point a noble woman had a child with someone other than her husband, and that child was raised as a legitimate heir, altering the course of English history. So where did the break happen? That was the multi-million dollar question. And here is where the story gets murky, where the revision in our title comes in. The 2014 research paper published in the prestigious journal Nature Communications was scientifically brilliant. But when it came to this explosive finding, the team was careful, and that is putting it lightly. They presented two main possibilities. Possibility one, the break in the Y chromosome line happened after Richard III, meaning it occurred somewhere in the long 500-year line of Somerset descendants, the modern-day Dukes of Beaufort. This was the safe explanation. It would mean Richard's own line was legitimate, but one of the Somersets down the line was not. It would be a minor scandal for a noble family, but it wouldn't rewrite the history of the crown. Possibility two, however, was the explosive one. The break happened before Richard III. This would mean that Richard, his brothers, including King Edward IV, or his father were not the biological sons of their supposed fathers. For 10 years, that is where the story sat. Until now. A new independent team at the University of Leicester, working with geneticists from Harvard and the Max Planck Institute, launched the Royal Bloodline Genomic Reanalysis Project in 2025. They weren't just retesting Richard's bones, they were going to pinpoint that break once and for all. The technology they used was science fiction compared to 2014. They used new, long-read sequencing methods, which can read massive, unbroken strands of DNA instead of just the tiny, shattered fragments from before. So, here's the deal. The new team needed more data points. Richard's Y chromosome was X. The modern Somerset's Y chromosome was Y. They were different. The original team didn't know which one was the true Plantagenet line. To solve this, the new team needed another undisputed ancient male line relative. They needed a control sample. They got permission from Westminster Abbey to take a tiny microscopic sample from the tomb of John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster. John of Gaunt was the son of King Edward III and the uncle of Richard II. Crucially, he lived and perished before the suspected break in the line could have ever happened. His DNA would be the Rosetta Stone. So does this genetic evidence make you rethink Richard III as a villain or just a desperate man trapped in a lie? Or do you think history should just ignore the biology? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit that like button and subscribe for more history mysteries uncovered.